Canada. Um, some of you may have noticed that we've had a little uh, Latin American flavor during the festival. And um, we, 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 we were thinking of what we should do um, to end this weekend um, with something very uh, exceptional. And there was one thing that seemed obvious to me and has seemed obvious to me um, for many months is that I really did want to find some way at Small Wonder to pay tribute to one of the greatest writers um, of the um, last, well, the last almost century because he lived a very long life um, and who was also an exceptional writer of short stories um, who died this year and that's um, Gabriel García Márquez. Um, and the, the, when I was researching him, uh, I, I came across something which perhaps I'd known in the past, but if I did, I'd certainly forgotten, that, that just to make it, uh, you know, to emphasize why it was uh, fitting that we should do this at Small Wonder, it turned out that, although slightly contrary to, ex to my expectations, that he was a great fan of Virginia Woolf, who I'm sure you all know um, is very, very closely associated with Charleston. So much so that in his early career, when he was writing under a pseudonym, he called himself Septimus um, after to the character in um, Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. Um, so it all, it all seemed to fit together. But I, I, I'm particularly delighted that, that um, Word Theatre um, have come here um, to produce this event for us. Um, I've known about and been involved with, uh, my, well, let's say my path has crossed with um, um, Cedring Fox and Kirsty Perp from Wor Word Theatre for several years. Uh, this is the first time we've actually managed to do something together. Uh, and um, Cedring actually lives in the States and uh, Los Angeles, and she's come here tonight from California, uh, Kirsty in the north of uh, England. Um, but somehow they managed to get all this together from there. Um, and uh, you'll be hearing from uh, Cedring later as it happens. Uh, and as you can see, they've assembled an amazing staff, uh, sorry, cast. <laughs> Uh, uh, um, an amazing cast. Harriet Walter, who actually uh, has been to Charleston before, but not for many years, um, and so has some uh, connections and actually feels as though she belongs here. Olivia Williams and Rashan Stone. Um, so we're thrilled to have such exceptional actors um, with us this evening to help us to pray tribute to Ga uh, Marquez and to bring his uh, wonderful stories alive. But before we get to the actors, I'm going to hand over to one of our own writers, Deborah Levy. Uh, and Deborah um, is going to give a, a writer's response to, uh, to Marquez, uh, to his work. Um, you know, uh, Deborah, Deborah has written award, uh, many award-winning books and in her her book of essays, uh, she actually, uh, uh, one of her essays, um, make, well, one of her essays is explicitly about Marquez, which actually I didn't even know when I approached her, but I just thought uh, my instinct was um, that she would have an affinity with Marquez. So may I invite Deborah Levy onto the platform? Thank you. It's a sweet moment in life to get the chance to pay my humble homage to the great Garcia Marquez, distinguished journalist, experimental filmmaker, that's not widely known, novelist, short story writer, and it was even rumored that um, at one time he was trying, he was being persuaded to run for president of Colombia. <laughs> I'm so glad he didn't. <laughs> the one thing we can be sure of is that I'm not pronouncing his name absolutely correctly. 
When he first published 100 Years of Solitude in 1967, and it began to be translated around the world, going on to sell 25 million copies and more, I can guess that one of the first questions he was asked in the West was, Mr. Garcia Marquez, how do I pronounce your name? Because as all writers start to get translated and prepare uh, for interviews with journalists, very nervous that we're going to be asked questions we can't answer, the first question is always, may I ask you, how do I pronounce your name? It's a fair enough question, it's a respectful question. There's a lot in a name, and as Garcia Marquez uh, paid so much attention to uh, the naming of his characters, I wanted to begin with his name. And what a crowd, what a cacophony of characters. Um, I grew up reading his short stories in my early 20s, and, and you will meet 15 characters at least in a short story. Characters who are wise, superstitious, scheming, desiring, brave, awkward, heartbroken, visionary. We are pulled inside their heads and cultures and geographies and anxieties and strategies to solve problems some of them political problems, uh, sometimes solved by the supernatural and usually in one paragraph. So I would like to salute the translators tonight who brought this great writing to us. Without them, I would not have the image in my head of the rain falling in Macondo, the fictional town located near the North Caribbean coast of Colombia where a hundred uh, years of solitude is set, the rain that falls and falls and washes away all traces of the most recent massacre. I would not have read lines such as these. He pleaded so much that he lost his voice. His bones began to fill with words or Lost in the solitude of his immense power, he began to lose direction. That's quite a subtle line, and I love it because uh, solitude is a theme that um, runs across all Garcia Marquez's work. Uh, and it's the solitude of the powerful, and it's the solitude of the dispossessed. I read A Hundred Years of Solitude when I was 20 in 1979. And now we cross over a whole century, and my daughter, who is 20, read it last week. That has to be the true meaning of a classic, a work of art that travels through cultures and generations, that takes us to somewhere we haven't been before, shows us a glimpse of something unknown to us, but nevertheless, we recognize ourselves there. We recognize our own human problems there. So it's not really just an exotic trip to a mango grove or to canoes decked with flowers or to women running out of their yard holding turkeys and suckling pigs. He takes us into the subjectivity of a servant sweeping the yard. And as Diana pointed out, um, in a uh, Paris Review interview, which is where that quote from Virginia Woolf uh, came, uh, Garcia Marquez was, was very influenced by her use of the technique of the interior, interior monologue. He said, I like the way she uses it better than Joyce. All his work um, blew my mind. What, why? I guess it was the clashing together of the ordinary and the extraordinary, the epic and inter intimate, myth and magic, politics and poetry. On the subject of poetry, I just wanted to read to you a few lines uh, he wrote when he won the 1982 Nobel Prize for Literature. 
My humble homage, a toast for the posy. On each line that I write, I try to invoke the elusive spirits of posy, and I try to leave on each word the testimony of my devotion for its virtues of divination and its permanent victory against the death powers of death. As for magic realism, I'm not going to say very much about it, except that he taught me that if you're going to have a crowd of butterflies fly out of a character's mouth, it's much better to write 52 butterflies flew out of her mouth. It's more precise. Something startling becomes a factual. But I did want to read you a few lines from a letter I found on the internet on magic realism. Um, oh. It's written by someone I, I personally haven't heard of. Her name is Sabrina Vulius. I think she's written it um, after, after he died. It's a letter to him. And um, she had read A Hundred Years of Solitude when she was 10. This is a tiny extract. Gabriel Garcia Marquez. I was a girl growing up in a Guatemala racked by a bloody undeclared civil war. I knew magic existed because I knew books existed. I loved 100 Years of Solitude, magic, politics, bloody operatic circumstance and family and times that as a young girl, I knew I was living even if my country wasn't Colombia. Firing squads, children with pigtails, steps ghosted by butterflies, Gabo gave us the words and images, and each of us wanted to claim a bit of the Macondo he recorded for us. When five years later we were forced to leave Guatemala by an escalating dirty war that would culminate in genocide, Garcia Marquez had already given me the language to speak of magic and realism and the notion to cross the borders he had shown me were porous between them. Now, that's a very different take from, um, uh, you know, when I, when I was a student, it was the fashion to bake bread, and we were all reading Marques. And we had this idea that if we were in a bad mood and we were kneading the dough, the bread would taste bitter. It would be the bread of discontent until my friend uh, Sean said, uh, well, I've just made some bread and I'm heartbroken. It's the best batch I've ever made. Um, when, you know, I, I think it's very important to hear that young woman's response to counter that sort of thing. Uh, again, in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, he says something very important. Um, Tellers of tales who, like me, are capable of believing anything, feel entitled to believe that it is not yet too late to undertake the creation of a minor utopia, a new and limitless utopia, wherein no one can decide for others how they are to die, where love can really be true and happiness possible, where the lineal generations of 100 years of solitude will have at last and forever a second chance on earth. He tells us that he got the tone for uh, 100 years of solitude by listening to the stories his grandmother told him. He was brought up by his grandmother, um, and I quote, she told things that sounded supernatural and fantastic, but she told them with complete naturalness. What was most important was the expression on her face. She did not change her expression at all when telling her stories, and everyone was surprised. I discovered that that was what I had to do. 
My grandmother told these stories with a brick face. Here's an example of that tone that I particularly love, and it's from Love in the Time of Cholera. There's a character called Femina Daza. She's 72 years old, and she keeps many domestic animals. And in all of Garcia Marquez's work, we meet many animals. Then there were the Abyssinian cats with the profiles of eagles and the manner of pharaohs, cross-eyed Siamese and palace Persians with orange eyes, who walked through the rooms like shadowy phantoms and shattered the night with the howling of their witches' Sabbaths of love. And let's not forget the short stories. Uh, his collection is out there. I think many collections are out there. Uh, my favorite collection is Leaf Storm. And in that book is a story called The Very Old Man with Wings. And it's about a man who um, is really quite ragged, who drops down from the sky into the garden of some poor folk who keep him in the chicken coop. This man speaks with a Norwegian accent and they think he's a sailor, and they start to charge the, the uh, villagers to come in and pluck a feather, uh, and, and this feather will cure uh, whatever it is they want to be cured. But it doesn't quite work out like that. Um, a blind man plucks a feather, hoping to recover his sight, and grows three new teeth instead. It should also be said that Kafka was a great influence on uh, Garcia Marquez. He said that when he read the first line of Metamorphosis, uh, <clears throat> as Gregor Samsa awoke that morning from uneasy dreams, he found himself transformed in his bed into a gigantic insect. He said he didn't know that anyone was allowed to write like that. If I had known I would have started writing a long time ago. Anybody can write anything so long as it's believed. And he goes on to say that sooner or later, people believe writers rather than governments. So thank you, Garcia Marquez, for making my world bigger, more interesting. Thank you for the politics. Thank you for the poetry. And if you're listening now, I hope you're lying in a hammock with one angel clipping your moustache and another massaging your feet. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah Levy. My name is Cedar Ing Fox, and I'm the artistic director of Word Theatre. We are on a mission to bring people together for performances of contemporary literature that illuminate the human condition, foster an appreciation for the written word, and engender compassion and empathy. It is such an honor to be here today. We've been trying to get here, and we are here thanks to EFG Bank. I have been partnered with Kirsty here in, in England. Um, since 2003, and we have been responsible for casting and directing the shortlisted stories for the Sunday Times EFG Short Story Award, which is the largest award in the world for a single short story, and they are major sponsors of Small Wonder, and when Diana offered this opportunity to put together a tribute to Gabriel Garcia Marquez, we jumped at it, and it really is EFG that has made it possible for, for us to be here. We specialize in contemporary short stories, but I read 100 Years of Solitude when I was 20, and reading as many contemporary short stories as I do, the influence, rereading all of Marquez's short stories to prepare for this today, it made me realize how many of today's writers have been so strongly influenced by his work. And I'm going to let the actors do the rest of the speaking today. We're going to have two readings. We're going to take a 15-minute intermission. Then we're going to come back 
for a third short story. We've actually done them in reverse order. Harriet will be reading the most recent in, in uh, one of the collections, the collected stories are organized in order of publication. We're starting from a later story and working our way back so that Olivia Williams' story was written, it was first published in 1950. And it's just, it's such a rich experience to spend time with these stories and, and just look at his, his work, really. So, please sit back and relax and enjoy Harriet Walter, who will read to you The Handsomest Drowned Man in the World. Handsomest. The first children who saw the dark and slinky bulge approaching through the sea let themselves think it was an enemy ship. Then they saw it had no flags or masts and they thought it was a whale. But when it was washed up on the beach, they removed the clumps of seaweed, the jellyfish tentacles and the remains of fish and flotsam and only then did they see it was a drowned man. They'd been playing with him all afternoon, burying him in the sand and digging him up again, when someone chanced to see them and spread the alarm in the village. The men who carried him to the nearest house noticed that he weighed more than any dead man they had ever known, almost as much as a horse. And they said to each other that maybe he'd been floating too long and the water had got into his bones. When they laid him on the floor, they said he'd been taller than all other men because there was barely enough room for him in the house. But they thought that maybe the ability to keep on growing after death was part of the nature of certain drowned men. He had the smell of the sea about him and only his shape gave one to suppose that it was the corpse of a human being because the skin was covered with a crust of mud and scales. They did not even have to clean off his face to know that the dead man was a stranger. The village was made up of only 20 odd wooden houses that had stone courtyards with no flowers and which was spread about on the end of a desert-like cape. There was so little land that mothers always went about with the fear that the wind would carry off their children and the few dead that the years had caused among them had to be thrown off the cliffs. But the sea was calm and bountiful and all the men fit into seven boats. So when they found the drowned man, they simply had to look at one another to see that they were all there. <laughs> that night, they did not go out to sea. While the men went to find out if anyone was missing in neighboring villages, the women stayed behind to care for the drowned man. They took the mud off with grass swabs. They removed the underwater stones entangled in his hair and they scraped the crust off with tools used for scaling fish. As they were doing that, they noticed that the vegetation on him came from far away oceans and deep water, and that his clothes were in tatters, as if he'd sailed through labyrinths of coral. They noticed too that he bore his death with pride, for he did not have the lonely look of other drowned men who came out of the sea or that haggard, needy look of men who drowned in rivers. But only when they finished cleaning him off did they become aware of the kind of man he was. And it left them breathless. Not only was he the tallest, strongest, most virile and best built man that they had ever seen, but even though they were looking at him, there was no room for him in their imagination. They could not find a bed in the village large enough to lay him on, nor was there a table solid enough to use for his wake. The tallest men's holiday pants would not fit him, nor the fattest one's Sunday shirts, nor the shoes of the one with the biggest feet. Fascinated by his huge size and his beauty, 
the women then noticed, and they decided to make him some pants from a large piece of sail, and a shirt from some bridal Brabant linen, so that he could continue through his death with dignity. As they sewed, sitting in a circle, and gazing at the corpse between stitches, it seemed to them that the wind had never been so steady, nor the sea so restless as on that night, and they supposed that the change had something to do with the dead man. They thought that if that magnificent man had lived in the village, his house would have had the widest doors, the highest ceiling and the strongest floor. His bedstead would have been made from a midship frame, held together by iron bolts, and his wife would have been the happiest woman in the world. <laughs> They thought that he would have had so much authority that he could have drawn fish out of the sea simply by calling their names. And he would have put so much work into his land that springs would have burst forth from among the rocks so that he would have been able to plant flowers on the cliffs. They secretly compared him to their own men, thinking that for all their lives, theirs were incapable of doing what he could do in one night. And they ended up dismissing them deep in their hearts as the weakest, meanest, and most useless creatures on the earth. <laughs> they were wandering through that maze of fantasy when the oldest woman, who as the oldest had looked upon the drowned man with more compassion than passion, sighed, he has the face of someone called Esteban. It was true. Most of them had only to take another look at him to see that he could not have any other name. The more stubborn among them, who were the youngest, still lived for a few hours with the illusion that when they put his clothes on and he lay among the flowers in patent leather shoes, his name might be Lautaro. But it was a vain illusion. There had not been enough canvas the poorly cut and worse sewn pants were too tight, and the hidden strength of his heart popped the buttons on his shirt. After midnight, the whistling of the wind died down and the sea fell into its Wednesday drowsiness. The silence put an end to any last doubts. He was Esteban. The women who had dressed him, who had combed his hair, had cut his nails and shaven him, were unable to hold back a shudder of pity when they had to resign themselves to his being dragged along the ground. It was then that they understood how unhappy he must have been with that huge body since it bothered him even after death. They could see him in life condemned to going through doors sideways, cracking his head on crossbeams, remaining on his feet during visits, not knowing what to do with his soft, pink sea lion hands while the lady of the house looked for her most resistant chair and begged him, frightened to death, sit here Esteban please. And he, leaning against the wall, smiling, don't bother ma'am, I'm fine where I am. His heels raw and his back roasted from having done the same thing so many times whenever he'd paid a visit. Don't bother ma'am, I'm fine where I am just to avoid the embarrassment of breaking up the chair and never knowing perhaps that the ones who said, don't go Esteban, at least wait till the coffee's ready, were the ones who later on would whisper, the big boob finally left, how nice, the handsome fool has gone. That was what the women were thinking beside the body a little before dawn. Later, when they covered his face with a handkerchief so that the light would not bother him, he looked so forever dead, so defenseless, so much like their men, that the first furrows of tears opened in their hearts. It was one of the younger ones who began the weeping. The others, coming too, went from sighs to wails, and the more they sobbed, the more they felt like weeping, because the drowned man was becoming all the more Esteban for them. And so they wept so much, for he was the most destitute, most peaceful, 
and most obliging man on earth, poor Esteban. So when the men returned with the news that the drowned man was not from the neighbouring villages either, the women felt an opening of jubilation in the midst of their tears. Praise the Lord, they sighed. He's ours. The men thought the fuss was only womanish frivolity. Fatigued because of the difficult nighttime inquiries, all they wanted was to get rid of the bother of the newcomer once and for all before the sun grew strong on that arid, windless day. They improvised a litter with the remains of foremasts and gaffs, tying it together with rigging so that it would bear the weight of the body until they reached the cliffs. They wanted to tie the anchor from a cargo ship to him so that he would sink easily into the deepest waves where fish are blind and divers die of nostalgia and bad currents would not bring him back to the shore as had happened with other bodies. But the more they hurried, the more the women thought of ways to waste time. They walked about like startled hens, pecking with the sea charms on their breasts some interfering on one side to put a scapula of the good wind on the drowned man, some on the other side to put a wrist compass on him. And after a great deal of get away from there, woman, stay out of the way, look, you almost made me fall on top of the dead man. The men began to feel mistrust in their livers and started grumbling about why so many main altar decorations for a stranger because no matter how many nails and holy water jars he had on him, the sharks would chew him all the same. But the women kept piling on their junk relics, running back and forth, stumbling, while they released in sighs what they did not in tears, so that the men finally exploded with, since when has there ever been such a fuss over a drifting corpse, a drowned nobody, a piece of cold Wednesday meat? One of the women, mortified by so much lack of care, then removed the handkerchief from the dead man's face. And the men were left breathless too. He was Esteban. It was not necessary to repeat it for them to recognize him. If they'd been told Sir Walter Raleigh, even they might have been impressed with his gringo accent, the macaw on his shoulder, his cannibal-killing blunderbuss. But there could be only one Esteban in the world. And there he was, stretched out like a sperm whale, shoeless, wearing the pants of an undersized child and with those stony nails that had to be cut with a knife. They only had to take the handkerchief off his face to see that he was ashamed, that it was not his fault that he was so big, or so heavy, or so handsome. And if he had known that this was going to happen, he would have looked for a more discreet place to drown in. Seriously, I would have tied an anchor off a galleon around my neck and staggered off a cliff like someone who doesn't like things in order not to be upsetting people now with this Wednesday dead body, as you people say in order not to be bothering anyone with this filthy piece of cold meat that doesn't have anything to do with me. There was so much truth in his manner that even the most mistrustful men, the ones who felt the bitterness of endless nights at sea, fearing that their women would tire of dreaming about them and begin to dream of drowned men, even they, and others who were harder still shuddered in the marrow of their bones at Esteban's sincerity. That was how they came to uphold the most splendid funeral they could conceive of for an abandoned, drowned man. Some women who had gone to get flowers in the neighboring villages returned with other women who could not believe what they'd been told and those women went back for more flowers when they saw the dead man. And they brought more and more until there were so many flowers and so many people that it was hard to walk about. At the final moment, it pained them to return him to the waters as an orphan. And they chose a father and mother from among the best people and aunts and uncles and cousins 
so that through him all the inhabitants of the village became kinsmen. Some sailors who heard the weeping from a distance went off course, and people heard of one who had himself tied to the mainmast, remembering ancient fables about sirens. While they fought for the privilege of carrying him on their shoulders along the steep escarpment by the cliffs, men and women became aware for the first time of the desolation of their streets, the dryness of their courtyards, the narrowness of their dreams, as they faced the splendor and beauty of their drowned man. They let him go without an anchor, so that he could come back if he wished, and whenever he wished. And they all held their breath for the fraction of centuries the body took to fall into the abyss. They did not need to look at one another to realize that they were no longer all present, that they would never be. But they also knew that everything would be different from then on, that their houses would have wider doors, higher ceilings, and stronger floors, so that Esteban's memory could go everywhere without bumping into beams, and no one in the future would dare whisper the big boob finally died too bad, the handsome fool has finally died, because they were going to paint their house fronts gay colors to make Esteban's memory eternal. And they were going to break their backs, digging for springs among the stones and planting flowers on the cliffs, so that in future years at dawn, the passengers on great liners would awake, suffocated by the smell of gardens on the high seas. And the captain would have to come down from the bridge in his dress uniform with his astrolabe, his pole star and his row of war medals and pointing to the promontory of roses on the horizon, he would say in 14 languages, look there, where the wind is so peaceful now that it's gone to sleep behind the beds. Over there, where the sun's so bright that the sunflowers don't know which way to turn. Yes, over there. That's Esteban's village. This next story was published in 1955, and it's called Nabo, the black man who made the angels wait. It will be read to you by Rashawn Stone, the handsomest man. <laughs> Nabo was lying down in the hay. He felt the smell of a urinated stable rubbing on his body. On his brown and shiny skin, he felt the warm embers of the last horses, but he couldn't feel the skin. Nabo couldn't feel anything. It was as if he'd gone to sleep with the last blow of the horseshoe on his forehead, and now that was the only feeling that he had. He opened his eyes. He closed them again, and then was quiet, stretched out, stiff, as he had been all afternoon, feeling himself growing without time, until someone behind him said, Come on, Nabo. You've slept enough already. He turned over and didn't see the horses. The door was closed. Nabo must have imagined that the animals were somewhere in the darkness, in spite of the fact that he couldn't hear their impatient stamping. He imagined that the person speaking to him was doing it from outside the stable, because the door was closed from the inside and barred. Once more, the voice behind him said, That's right, Nabo. You've slept enough already. You've been asleep for almost three days. 
Only then did Nabo open his eyes completely and remember. I'm here because a horse kicked me. He didn't know what hour he was living. The days had been left behind. It was as if someone had passed a damp sponge over those remote Saturday nights when he used to go into the town square. He forgot about the white shirt. He forgot that he had a green hat made of green straw and dark pants. He forgot that he didn't have any shoes. Nabu would go to the square on Saturday nights and sit in the corner, silent, not to listen to the music, but to watch the black man. Every Saturday he saw him. This black man wore horn-rimmed glasses tied to his ears, and he played the saxophone at one of the rear music stands. Nabo saw the black man, but the black man didn't see Nabo. At least, if someone had known that Nabo went to the square on Saturday nights to see the Negro and had asked him, not now because he couldn't remember, whether the black man had ever seen him, Nabo would have said, no. It was the only thing he did after currying the horses. Watch the black man. One Saturday, the Negro wasn't at his place in the band. Nabo probably thought at first that he wasn't going to play anymore in the public concerts, in spite of the fact that the music stand was there. Although, for that reason precisely, the fact that the music stand was there, he thought, later, that the Negro would be back the following Saturday. But on the following Saturday, he wasn't back. And the music stand wasn't in its place. Nabo rolled onto one side, and he saw the man talking to him. At first, he didn't recognize him, blotted out by the darkness of the stable. The man was sitting on a jutting beam, talking and patting his knee. A horse kicked me, Nabo said again, trying to recognize the man. That's right, the man said. The horses aren't here now, and we're waiting for you in the choir. Nabo shook his head. He still hadn't begun to think, but now he thought he'd seen the man somewhere. Nabo didn't understand, but he didn't find it strange either that someone should say that to him, because every day while he curried the horses, he invented songs to distract them. Then he would sing the same songs to the horses in the living room to distract the mute girl. When he was singing, if someone had told him that he was taking him to a choir, it wouldn't have surprised him. Now he was surprised even less because he didn't understand. He was fatigued, dulled, brutish. I want to know where the horses are, he said. And the man said, I already told you, the horses aren't here. All we are interested in is to get a voice like yours. And perhaps face down in the hay, Nabo heard but he couldn't distinguish the pain that the horseshoe had left on his forehead from his other disoriented sensations. He turned his head on the hay and fell asleep. Nabo still went to the square for two or three weeks, in spite of the fact that the Negro was no longer in the band. Perhaps someone would have answered him if Nabo had asked what had happened to the black man, but he didn't ask and kept on going to the concerts until another man with another saxophone came to take the Negro spot. Then, Nabo was convinced that the Negro wouldn't be back, and he decided not to return to the square. When he awoke, he thought he had slept a very short time. The smell of damp hay still burned in his nose. The darkness was still there before his eyes, surrounding him, and the man was still in the corner. The obscure and peaceful voice of the man who patted his knees, saying, We're waiting for you, Nabo. You have been asleep for almost two years, and you refuse to get up. Then Nabo closed his eyes again. He opened them again, kept looking at the corner, and saw the man once more, disoriented, perplexed. Only then did he recognize him. 
If the people in the house had known what Nabo was doing on the square on Saturday nights, they probably would have thought that when he stopped going, he did so, did so because now he had music at home. That was when we brought the gramophone to amuse the girl. Since it needed someone to wind it up all day, it seemed most natural that the person should be Nabo. He could do it when he didn't have to take care of the horses. The girl remained seated, listening to the records. Sometimes when the music was playing, the girl would get out of her chair, still looking at the wall, drooling, and would drag herself to the veranda. Nabo would lift the needle and start to sing. In the beginning, when he first came to the house, we thought that's all he could do. Nabo said that he could sing, but that didn't interest anyone. What we needed was a boy to curry the horses. Nabo stayed, but he kept on singing as if we had hired him to sing, and the business of currying the horses was only distraction that made the work easier. That went on for more than a year, until those of us in the house grew used to the idea that the girl would never be able to walk, would never recognize anyone, and would always be the little dead and lonely girl who listened to the gramophone, looking coldly at the wall until we lifted her out of her chair and took her to her room. Then she ceased to pain us, but Nabo was still faithful, punctual, cranking the gramophone. That was during the time when Nabo was still going to the square on Saturday nights. One day, when the boy was in the stable, someone beside the gramophone said, Nabo! We were on the veranda, not concerned about something that no one could have said, but when we heard it a second time, Nabo! We raised our heads and asked, uh, who's with the girl? And someone said, well, I didn't see anyone coming in. And another said, well, I'm sure I heard a voice calling Nabo. But when we went to look, all we found was the girl on the floor, leaning against the wall. Nabo came back early and went to bed. It was the following Saturday that he didn't return to the square because the Negro had been replaced. And three weeks later, on a Monday, the gramophone began to play while Nabo was in the stable. No one was worried at first. Only later, when we saw the black boy coming, singing, and still dripping from the water of the horses, did we ask him, how did you get out? He said, through the door. I've been in the stable since noon. The gramophone's playing, can't you hear it? We asked him. And Nabo said he could. And we asked him, who wound it up? And he, shrugging his shoulders, said, the girl. She's been winding it up for a long time now. That was the way things were, until the day we found him lying face down on the hay, locked in the stable, and with the edge of the horseshoe encrusted in his forehead. When we picked him up by the shoulders, Nabo said, I'm here because a horse kicked me. But no one was interested in what he might have said. We were interested in his cold, dead eyes and mouth full of green froth. He spent the whole night weeping, burning with fever, delirious, talking about the comb that he'd lost in the hay in the stable. That was the first day. On the following day, when he opened his eyes and said, I'm thirsty, and we brought him water, he drank it all down in one swallow and twice asked for a little more. We asked him how he felt, and he said, I feel as if a horse kicked me. And he kept talking all day and all night. And finally, he sat up in bed, pointed up with his forefinger, and said that the galloping of the horses had kept him awake all night. But he'd had no fever since the night before. He was no longer delirious. But he kept on talking until they put a handkerchief in his mouth. Then Nabo began to sing behind the handkerchief, saying that next to his ear he could hear the breathing of the blind horses looking for water on top of the closed door. 
When we took out the handkerchief so that he could eat something, he turned towards the wall, and we all thought that he'd fallen asleep. And it was even possible that he had fallen asleep for a while. But when he awoke, he was no longer on the bed. His feet were tied, and his hands were tied to a brace beam in the room. Trussed up, Nabo began to sing. When he recognized him, Nabo said to the man, I've seen you before. And the man said, every Saturday, you used to watch me in the square. And Nabo said, that's right. But I thought I saw you and you didn't see me. And the man said, I never saw you. But later on, when I stopped coming, I felt as if someone had stopped watching me on Saturdays. And Nabo said, you never came back, but I kept going on for three or four weeks. And the man, still not moving, patting himself on the knees. I couldn't go back to the square, even though it was the only thing that was worth anything. Nabo tried to sit up, shook his head in the hay, and still he heard the cold, obstinate voice, until he no longer had time even to know that he was falling asleep again. Always, ever since the horse had kicked him, that happened. And he always heard the voice, We're waiting for you, Nabo. There's no longer any way to measure the time that you have been asleep. Four weeks after the Negro had stopped coming to the band, Nabo was combing the tail of one of the horses. He'd never done that. He would just curry them and sing to them in the meantime. But on Wednesday, he'd gone to the market and had seen a comb and had said to himself, that comb is for combing horses' tails. That was when the whole thing happened with the horse that gave him a kick and left him all mixed up for the rest of his life. 10 or 15 years before. Somebody in the house said, it would have been better if he died that day and hadn't gone on like this, all through talking nonsense for the rest of his life. But no one had seen him again, ever since the day we locked him up. Only we know that he was there, locked up in the room. And since then, the girl hadn't moved the gramophone again. But in the house, we had very little interest in knowing about it. We'd locked him up as if he were a horse, as if the kick had passed the sluggishness on to him, and encrusted on his forehead was all the stupidity of horses' animalness. And we left him isolated within four walls, as if we decided he should die of imprisonment, because we weren't cold-blooded enough to kill him in any other way. Fourteen years passed like that, until one of the children grew up and said he had the urge to see his face. And he opened the door. Nabo saw the man again. A horse kicked me, he said. And the man said, You've been saying that for centuries, and in the meantime, We've been waiting for you in the choir. Nabu shook his head again, sank his wounded forehead into the hay once more, and thought he suddenly remembered how things had happened. It was the first time I ever combed a horse's tail, he said. And the man said, We wanted it that way, so that you would come and sing in the choir. And Nabu said, I shouldn't have bought the comb. And the man said, you would have come across it in any case. We had decided that you'd find the comb and comb the horse's tails. And Nabo said, I'd never stood behind them before. And the man, still tranquil, still not showing impatience. But you did stand there, and the horse kicked you. It was the only way for you to come to the choir. The conversation, implacable, daily went on until someone in the house said, 
It must be 15 years since anyone opened that door. The girl, she hadn't grown. She was over 30 and was beginning to get sad in her eyelids, was sitting looking at the wall when they opened the door. She turned her face in the other direction, sniffing. And when they closed the door, they said again, Nabo's peaceful. There's nothing moving inside anymore. One of these days he'll die and we won't be able to tell, except for the smell. And someone said, well, we can tell by the food. He's never stopped eating. He's fine like that, locked up with no one to bother him. He gets good light from the rear side. And things stayed like that, except that the girl kept on looking toward the door, sniffing the warm fumes that filtered through the cracks. She stayed like that until early in the morning when we heard a metallic sound in the living room. And we remembered that it was the same sound that had been heard 15 years before when Nabo was winding the gramophone. We got up, lighted the lamp, and heard the first measures of the forgotten song, the sad song that had been dead on the records for such a long time. The sound kept on, more arid, more strained, until a dry sound was heard at the instant we reached the living room, and we could still hear the record playing and saw the girl in the corner beside the gramophone looking at the wall and holding up the crank. We didn't say anything, but went back to our rooms, remembering that someone had told us sometime that the girl knew how to crank the gramophone. Thinking that, we stayed awake, listening to the worn little tune from the record that was still spinning on what was left of the broken spring. The day before, when they opened the door, it smelled of biological waste, of a dead body. The one who had opened it shouted, Nabo, Nabo. But nobody answered from the inside. Beside the opening was the empty plate. Three times a day, the plate was put under the door and three times a day, the plate came out again with no food on it. That was how we knew that Nabo was still alive but by no other means. There was no more moving inside, no more singing. And it must have been after they closed the door that Nabo said to the man, I can't go to the choir. And the man asked why. And Nabo said, because I haven't got any shoes. And the man raising his feet said, that doesn't matter. Nobody wears shoes here. And Nabo saw the hard yellow soles of the bare feet the man was holding up. I've been waiting here for you for an eternity, the man said. The horse only kicked me a moment ago, Nabo said. Now, I'll throw a little water on my face and take them out for a walk. And the man said, the horses don't need you anymore. There aren't any more horses. You're the one who should come with us. And Nabo said, the horses should have been here. He got up a little, sank his hands into the hay, while the man said, they haven't had anyone to look after them for 15 years. But Nabo was scratching the ground under the hay saying, the comb must be here, it must still be here. And the man said, they closed up the stable 15 years ago. It's full of rubbish now. And Nabo said, rubbish doesn't collect in one afternoon. Until I find the comb, I won't move out of here. On the following day, after they'd fastened the door again, they heard the difficult movements inside once more. No one moved afterward. No one said anything again when the first creaks were heard and the door began to give way under unusual pressure. Inside, something like the panting of a penned animal was heard. Finally, the groan of rusty hinges was heard as they broke 
when Nabo shook his head again. Until I find the comb, I won't go to the choir, he said. It must be around here somewhere. And he dug in the hay, breaking it, scratching the ground, until the man said, all right, Nabo. If the only thing you're waiting for to come to the choir is to find the comb, go look for it. He leaned forward, his face darkened by a patient haughtiness. He put his hands against the barrier and said, Go ahead, Nabo. I'll see that nobody stops you. And then the door gave way and the huge bestial Negro with the harsh scar marked on his forehead, in spite of the fact that 15 years had passed, came out stumbling over the furniture, his fists raised and menacing, still with the rope they had tied him with 15 years before, when he was a little black boy who looked after the horses. And before reaching the courtyard, he passed by the girl who remained seated, the crank of the gramophone still in her hand. When she saw the unchained black force, she remembered something that at one time must have been a word. And he reached the courtyard before finding the stable, after having knocked down the living room mirror with his shoulder, but without seeing the girl, neither beside the gramophone nor in the mirror. And he stood with his face to the sun, his eyes closed, blind, while inside the noise of the broken mirror was still going on. He ran aimlessly, like a blindfolded horse, instinctively looking for the stable door that 15 years of imprisonment had erased from his memory, but not from his instincts. Since that remote day, when he had combed the horse's tail and was left befuddled for the rest of his life, and leaving behind catastrophe, dissolution, and chaos like a blindfolded bull in a room full of lamps, he reached the backyard, still without finding the stable, and scratched on the ground with a tempestuous fury with which he had knocked down the mirror, thinking, perhaps, that by scratching on the ground, he could make the smell of mare's urine rise up again. Until he finally reached the stable doors and pushed them, too soon, falling inside on his face. In his death agony, perhaps, but still confused by that fierce animalness that a half second before had prevented him from hearing the girl, who raised the crank when she heard him pass and remembered drooling, but without moving from the chair without moving her mouth, but twirling the crank of the gramophone in the air, remembered the only word she had ever learned to say in her life, and she shouted it from the living room. Nabo! Nabo! We'll take a brief 15-minute intermission. I hope you'll pick up some books, and we'll be back for one more story and a little gathering of, with the actors and Deborah for Q&A.
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. And for our third and final story, it is my great pleasure to introduce Olivia Williams, who will read to you The Woman Who Came at Six O'Clock. The door swung open. At that hour, there was nobody in Jose's restaurant. It had just struck six, and the man knew that the usual customers wouldn't begin to arrive until 6.30. His clientele was so conservative and regular that the clock hadn't finished striking six when a woman entered. As on every day at that hour, she sat down on the stool without saying anything. She had an unlit cigarette tight between her lips. Hello, Reina, Jose said when he saw her sit down. Then he went to the other end of the counter, wiping the streaked surface with a dry rag. Whenever anyone came into the restaurant, Jose did the same thing, even with the woman with whom he'd almost come to acquire a degree of intimacy the fat, ruddy restaurant owner put on his daily act of a hard-working man. He spoke from the other end of the counter. What do you want today? First of all, I want to teach you to be a gentleman, the woman said. She was sitting on the last stool, her elbows on the counter, the unlit cigarette between her lips. When she spoke, she tightened her mouth around the cigarette to draw Jose's attention. Oh, I, I didn't notice, Jose said. You never notice anything, said the woman. The man left the cloth on the counter and walked to the dark cupboards which smelt of tar and dusty wood and came back immediately with the matches. The woman leant over to get the light that was burning in the man's coarse and hairy hands. Jose saw the woman's lush hair, greased with cheap, thick Vaseline. He saw her uncovered shoulder above the flowered brazier. And as she raised her head with a cigarette between her lips, he saw the rise of her twilight breast. You're beautiful tonight, Reina, Jose said. Don't call me that. I'm not the bloody queen, the woman said. And if you think that'll make me pay, you can forget it. That's not what I meant, Reina, Jose said. Sounds like your lunch must have disagreed with you. The woman sucked in the first drag of thick smoke and crossed her arms her elbows still on the counter and stared into the street through the wide restaurant windows. She had a melancholy expression, bored, vulgar, melancholy. I'll fix you a steak, Jose said. I still haven't got any money, the woman said. You haven't had any money for three months and I always fix you something good, Jose said. Today's different, the woman said somberly, still looking out at the street. <laughs> well, every day's the same, Jose said. Every day the clock says six, you come in, say you're hungry as a dog, and then I fix you something good. The only difference is this. Today you didn't say you're hungry as a dog. You said, today's different. And it's true, the woman said. She turned to look at the man who was at the other end of the counter, checking the refrigerator, and she examined him for two, three seconds. Then she looked at the clock over the cupboard. It was three minutes after six. Yeah, it's true, Jose. Today is different. 
she let the smoke out. And then she started talking with a passionate staccato word. I didn't come at six today. That's why it's different, Jose. The man looked at the clock. Well, if that clock is one minute slow, I'll cut off my arm, he said. Not about the clock, Jose. I didn't come at six o'clock today, the woman said. But it just struck six, Reina, Jose said. When, when you came in, it was just finishing. Now, I'd already been here a quarter of an hour by then, the woman said. <laughs> Jose went over to where she was. He put his great puffy face up to the woman. He pulled up one of her eyelids with, an, with his index finger and inspected her pupils. Let me smell your breath, he said. The woman pulled her head away. She was serious, annoyed, but softened somehow, embellished by a cloud of sorrow and fatigue. Don't talk rubbish, Jose. You know I haven't had a drink for six months. Yeah, yeah, save it for someone else, not me, he said. I reckon you had a bottle between you, at least. Yeah, I had a couple of drinks with a friend, she said. Yeah. Now I understand, Jose said. Look, there's nothing to understand, the woman said. I have been here for a quarter of an hour. The man shrugged his shoulders. All right. That's the way you want it. Been here a quarter of an hour. What difference does it make? Ten minutes here or there? It makes a difference, Jose, the woman said. And she stretched her arms over the glass counter with an air of careless neglect. She said... And it's not what I want. It's just that... It's just that I've been here for a quarter of an hour. She looked at the clock again, as if correcting herself. In fact, what am I saying? Well, now it's been 20 minutes. Look, that's fine. It's fine, Reina, the man said. Listen, I'll give you a whole day and the following night. I just, I just want to make you happy. Throughout this exchange... Jose had been moving about behind the counter, rearranging things, taking something from one place, putting it in another, playing his role. Just want to see you happy, he repeated. He stopped suddenly. He turned to where the woman was. You know I love you very much. The woman looked at him coldly. Oh, really? Now that is news, Jose. <laughs> and do you think I'd sleep with you, even for a million pesos? I didn't mean that, Reina, Jose said. That's your indigestion talking. <laughs> That's not why I said it, said the woman. And her voice became less indolent. No woman could stand a weight like yours. Not even for a million pesos. Jose's face reddened. He turned his back to the woman and began to dust the bottles on the shelves. He spoke without turning his head. You're insufferable today, Reina. I think it's best you eat your steak and go home to bed. Not hungry, the woman said. She stayed, looking out at the street again, watching the indistinguishable passers-by of a city at dusk. For an instant, there was a murky silence in the restaurant, broken only by Jose's bustling about in the larder. Suddenly, the woman stopped looking out into the street and spoke, this time with a tender, soft, a different voice. Is it true that you love me, Papilla? It's true, Jose said dryly, not looking at her. In spite of what, of what I said to you, the woman said. What did you say to me? Jose asked, still without any inflection in his voice, still without looking at her. What I said, not for a million pesos, the woman said. It's already forgotten, Jose said. So you, so you do love me? The woman asked. Yes, 
said Jose. There was a pause. Jose kept moving about, his face turned toward the cabinet, still not looking at the woman. She blew out another lungful of smoke, rested her breasts on the counter, and then cautiously, roguishly biting her tongue before saying it as if speaking on tiptoes. Enough, even though I'll never sleep with you? She asked. Only then did Jose turn to look at her. I love you so much that I wouldn't sleep with you, he said. Then he walked over to where she was. He stood looking into her face, his powerful arms leaning on the counter in front of her. Looking into her eyes, he said, I love you so much that every night I would kill every man who sleeps with you. The woman seemed perplexed. Then she scrutinized the man with an expression somewhere between compassion and mockery. For a moment, there was a brief disconcerted silence, <laughs> and then, and then she laughed. <laughs> You're jealous. Jose, that is wild. You are jealous. Jose blushed again with unconcealed, almost shameful timidity. Like a child, he blurted out all his secrets. He said, you don't understand anything today, Reina. And he wiped away some sweat with a rag and then said, this way of life is brutalizing you. But now the woman had changed her expression. So, she said, and she looked into his eyes again with a strange glow in her look, wounded but challenging at the same time. So you're not jealous? In a way I am, Jose said, but not the way you think. He loosened his collar. He continued dabbing the sweat, drying his throat with the cloth. So, the woman asked. The fact is that I love you so much that I don't like what you do, Jose said. What? The woman asked. I don't like that you're with a different man every day, Jose said. <laughs> Would you really kill a man to stop him from going with me? The woman asked. No, not to stop him from going with you. No, Jose said. I'd kill him because he went with you. Same thing, the woman said. This conversation had reached a passionate intensity. The woman was speaking in a soft, low, fascinated voice. Her, voice was, her face was almost pressed against the man's healthy, peaceful face as he stood motionless, as if bewitched by the very vapour of the words. That's true, Jose said. So, the woman said, and she reached out her hand to stroke the man's rough arm, flicking her cigarette away with the other. So... So you're capable of killing a man? For what I told you, yeah, Jose said. And his voice took on an almost dramatic rhythm. The woman broke into convulsive laughter, <laughs> clearly intended to mock him. Oh, how horrible, Jose. Oh, that's horrible, she said laughing. Jose, killing a man. Who would have known that behind the fat, kind man who never makes me pay, who cooks me a steak every day and has a laugh with me until I find a man. There lurks a murderer. How horrible, Jose. Ooh, I'm really scared. Jose was confused. Maybe he felt a little indignation. Maybe when the woman started laughing, he felt disappointment. You're drunk, you stupid woman, he said. Go and get some sleep if you're not going to eat anything. But the woman had stopped laughing now and was serious again, pensive, leaning on the counter. She watched the man turn away. She watched him open the refrigerator and close it again without taking anything out. She watched him move to the other end of the counter. She watched him polish the shining glass, same as he'd always done. Then the woman spoke again, 
with the tender softness she'd used when she said, is it true that you love me? Jose, she said. The man didn't look at her. Jose, go home and sleep, Jose said, and take a bath before you go to bed so you can sleep it off. Seriously, Jose, the woman said. I'm not drunk. Then you've turned stupid, Jose said. Come here, come here, Jose. I have to talk to you, the woman said. The man came stumbling over, somewhere between flirtation and mistrust. Come closer. He stood in front of the woman again, and she leant forward. She grabbed him by the hair with a gesture of obvious tenderness. Tell me again what you said at first, she whispered. What do you mean, Jose asked. He was trying to look at her, but she turned his gaze away, holding him by the hair. That you would kill a man who slept with me, the woman said. <coughs> I'd kill a man who slept with you, Reina. That's right, Jose said, and the woman let him go. In that case, you'd defend me if I killed him, she demanded, coquettishly pulling at Jose's enormous pig head, and the man didn't answer. He smiled. Answer me, Jose, the woman said. Would you defend me if I killed him? That depends, Jose said. You know it's not as simple as that. But the police, would you believe you more than they'd believe anyone, the woman said. Jose smiled. He was honored. He was flattered. The woman leant over towards him again, over the counter. It's true, Jose. I don't think you've ever told a lie in your whole life. Now that won't get you anywhere, Jose said. And therefore, the woman said, since the police know you, They'll believe anything you say without asking you twice. Jose beat his fist on the counter opposite her, not knowing what to say. The woman looked out again at the street. Then she looked at the clock and her tone of voice changed. She became impatient to finish the conversation before the first customers arrived. Would you tell a lie for me, Jose? She asked her voice in earnest now. Jose looked at her again, sharply, deeply, as if in a terrible realization, as if it had come pounding into his head, a realization that had entered through one ear, spun about for a moment, vague, confused, gone out the other ear, leaving behind only a warm vestige of terror. What have you got yourself into, Raina? Jose asked. He leant forward, his arms folded over the counter again. The woman caught the ammonia vapor of his breath, struggling against the pressure of his stomach against the counter. It's serious, Raina. What have you got yourself into? He asked. The woman put her head on one side. Nothing, she said. I was just talking to amuse myself. She looked at him again. You know, you, you wouldn't even have to kill anyone. I didn't intend to kill anyone, Jose said, distressed. No, no, hombre, the woman said. I mean, from now on, from now on, nobody goes to bed with me. Oh, Jose said, finally you're talking sense. I have never understood why you walk the streets. If you give it up, I will cook you the biggest steak I've got every day, free of charge. Thank you, Jose, the woman said, but that's not why. The fact is I, hmm, I can't go to bed with anyone anymore. You're drunk, you're talking rubbish again, Jose said, and he was becoming impatient. I'm talking absolute sense, the woman said. She stretched up from the seat, and Jose saw her flat, sad breasts beneath her brassiere. Tomorrow I'm going away, and I promise you I won't come back. I won't bother you ever again. I promise you I'll never go to bed with anyone. 
Where's all this coming from, Jose asked. I, de I decided it. I decided it a minute, minute ago, the woman said. Just, just a minute ago, I realised what a dirty business this is. Jose grabbed the cloth again and started to clean the glasses in front of her, and he spoke without looking at her. He said, yeah, of course, the way you do it, it's a dirty business. And you should have known that a long time ago. I began to realise it a long time ago, the woman said, but I was only convinced of it just now. Men, men disgust me. Jose smiled. He raised his head to look at her, still smiling. But he saw her concentrated, perplexed, talking with her shoulders raised, balancing on the stool with a taciturn expression, her skin with a sheen of bronzed face powder. Do you think, do you think they ought to let off a woman who kills a man because after she's been with him, she feels disgusted by him? And she feels disgusted by everyone who's ever been with her. There's no reason to go that far, Jose said, moved, moved by a thread of pity in his voice. What if the woman tells the man he disgusts her while she watches him get dressed because she remembers that she's been rolling around with him all afternoon and she feels that neither soap nor sponge can get that smell off her. These things pass, Raina, Jose said, a little indifferent now. He, he started polishing the counter. Look, there's no reason to kill him. Just, just let him go. But the woman kept on talking and her voice was a steady stream, a passionate current. But what if the woman tells the man he disgusts her and the man stops getting dressed and he comes back over to her and he kisses her again and then he... No decent man would ever do that, Jose said. Well, what if he does? The woman asked with rising anxiety. What if the man isn't decent and he does it? And then the woman feels that she'll die of disgust and she only knows that the only way to end it is, is to stick a knife in him, to stick a knife under him. That would be barbaric, Jose said. And luckily, there is no man who would do that to you. Well, the woman said, completely exasperated now, what if he did? Suppose he did. Look, there's nothing to be said either way, Jose said, and he kept on cleaning the counter. He didn't change position, and he, he, he stopped concentrating on the conversation now. The woman pounded the counter with her knuckles. She became affirmative, emphatic. You are a savage, Jose, she said. You don't understand anything. She grabbed him by the sleeve. Go on, go on, say it. Say that the woman should kill him. All right, Jose said with a conciliatory tone. It's all just exactly the way you say it is. Isn't that self-defense, the woman asked, grabbing him by the sleeve again? Jose gave her a comforting look. Almost, he said. Yeah, almost. And, and he winked at her, an expression of, of comprehension, but fearful complicity. But the woman was serious. And she let go of him. Would you tell a lie? to defend a woman who does that, she asked. Well, that, that depends, said Jose. Depends on what, the woman asked. Well, that depends on the woman, said Jose. Suppose, suppose it's a woman that you love a lot, the woman said. N not to sleep with her, but like you say, you love her a lot, as I love you. Reina, Jose said, faintly, bothered. He turned away. He looked at the clock. He'd seen that it was going on half past six, and he thought that in a few minutes the restaurant would be filling up with people, and maybe that was why he began to polish the glass with greater effort. Looking at the street through the window, the woman 
stayed on her stool, silent, concentrating, watching the man's movements with an air of declining sadness, watching him as if he were a lamp starting to dim. Suddenly, without reacting, she spoke again with the gentle voice of servitude. Jose? The man looked at her with a thick, sad tenderness, like a maternal ox. He didn't look at her to listen to her, just to look, just to know that she was there hoping for a look that sought neither protection nor solidarity, hoping for the look of a plaything. I told you I was leaving tomorrow. You didn't say anything, the woman said. Yes, Jose said. You didn't tell me where. <laughs> Out there, the woman said, where there aren't any men who want to sleep with me. Jose smiled again. You're really going away, he asked, as if becoming aware of a, of a turning point in life quickly changing the expression on his face. Well, that depends on you, the woman said. If you understand enough to say what time I got here, I'll go away tomorrow and I'll never get mixed up in this again. Would you like that? Jose gave an affirmative nod, smiling, concrete. The woman leant over to where he was. I'll come back someday. And I'll get jealous when I find another woman talking to you at this same time. On this same stool. Well, if you come here. You'll have to bring me something, Jose said. I'll find you a toy, she said, a wind-up bear, and I'll bring him to you, I promise, the woman said. Jose smiled and wiped the cloth through the air that separated him from the woman, as if he were cleaning an invisible pane of glass. The woman smiled too, a friendly, flirting smile. Then the man went away, polishing his glass to the other side of the counter. And what then, Jose said without looking at her. Will you really tell anyone who asks that I got here at quarter to six? The woman said. What for? Jose said, still without looking at her now, as if he'd barely heard her. That doesn't matter, the woman said. The thing is that you do it. Jose then saw the first customer come in through the swing door. He walked over to a corner table. Jose looked at the clock. 6.30 on the dot. All right, Raina, he said distractedly. Anything you say. I'll always do whatever you want. Well, <laughs> said the woman. Start cooking my steak then. The man went to the refrigerator. He took out a plate with a piece of meat on it. He left it on the table and he lit the stove. I'm going to cook you a farewell steak, Reina, he said. Thank you, Pepillo, the woman said. She remained thoughtful as if suddenly she had become sunken in a strange sub-world, peopled with muddy, unknown forms. Across the counter, she couldn't hear the noise that the raw meat made when it fell into the burning grease. She didn't hear the dry crackle as Jose turned the flank over in the frying pan with the succulent smell of the meat gradually saturating the air of the restaurant. She remained like that, concentrated, reconcentrated, until she raised her head again, blinking, as if returning from a momentary death. Then she saw the man at the stove, lit up by the flames. Pepillo? What? What are you thinking about? The woman asked. I was 
I was wondering if you'd find me a wind-up bear someplace, Jose said. Of course I can, the woman said. But what I want is for you to give me everything I asked for as a going-away present. Jose looked at her from the stove. <laughs> How many times do I have to tell you, he said. You want something besides the steak I've got? <sighs> yes, the woman said. Well, what is it? Jose asked. I want another quarter of an hour. Jose drew back. He looked at the clock. He looked at the customer who was still silent waiting in the corner. And finally he looked at the meat roasting in the pan. And only then did he speak. I don't really understand, Reina, he said. You're no fool, Jose, the woman said. Just remember, I've been here since 5.30. I thought you might enjoy just a five minute, um, to, five minutes to hear from the actors about their process. Is that a nice idea? Okay. Um, just because we're running over a bit, we're not going to have the wonderful Deborah Levy come up, but we're just going to bring the actors up and just have a, a quick, and if there's anybody who would like to ask a question, this would be the time. So just give us a moment to organize the chairs. You're, you're free to leave. And Jay, did you have some uh, cordless mics for us, Jay? Which one here? Oh, here's one. Okay, great. Did we want to start with a question from the audience? Did anybody there have one? So, um, first of all, can we just give a big hand for... Olivia Williams, Harriet Walter, and Rashawn Stone. This is a great pleasure for me to get actors of this caliber to become the vessels who interpret. It's a, it's a process where where I select the story, and in this case, they're my first choices for every one of these. I actually pick the, I pick the stories for the actor, and, um, and then we kind of pull the story apart, and they really become the, the unique interpreter of this process, and, and it's, it's, you know, when you have a great writer, it's, it's like Shakespeare. Why do we go back and see these plays again and again to have the different interpreters? But I just thought you might like to hear from them in their words. We'll start with Rashawn. Um, just about what it felt like to go through being the voices that brought us the story. Um, well, what I'd say is that, the, you know, looking at the the stories on the page is such a different experience because obviously as actors we're all about you know you take the words from the page and then we speak and uh, you know I don't know the reason behind the writing of the stories but when I read it uh, reading it in my head was a completely different experience of saying it out loud so it's trying to find a connection with it knowing that you're reading the story aloud and it's very very different to when you're just absorbing a story at home tucked up in bed which I was when I read it the first time um, and then also, you know, as actors, we have to constantly remind ourselves, you know, don't rush, you know, <laughs> make sure that you're guiding the audience through the story. But um, he's so clever. And I, the thing that stumped me in, in the particular story that I did is that the, nar the, sort of the narrator's voice changes throughout the story. And sometimes it changes in the middle of a line. And so 
we had to make some choices about which narrator was doing which bit and then you'd start off doing one voice and then realize by the end of the line you were the different narrator and it and actually most of the technical work that we did was um was that just so that you guys could understand the story and could feel sort of that you were inside it um and then we found some voices that seemed to make sense and uh and actually, and then the final thing actually is just being here and doing it, and it's um, realizing that yeah, they're just such great stories. They really are great stories, and that you do kind of get taken away by the stories as you're reading. Um, hopefully, they're enjoyable. But yeah, that's that was my experience of of that story. Yeah. It, it's interesting to me because when I first read that story, I immediately emailed Rashawn from Los Angeles, and I just thought this is the actor for this story. And, and it wasn't, we, we ended up having to really figure it out. And the reading that you did is the reading that I, that moved me so much when I first read the story in the quiet of my room. But then I got lost until, you know, as we just kind of tried to figure out because there's the, the boy and then there's the angel and then there's the family member who's horrified by his role in all this and the girl and it's just it's really interesting in fact it reminds me of the hillary mantel story that you read yes. that harriet read um um well they've all read sunday times efg short stories uh, shortlisted stories and harriet read a very beautiful Harriet, um, Hilary Mantel story um, about, about a girl who was quite neglected and, and off. And yeah, how they, you know, I think, I mean, his writing, I think anybody who's read him is taking something away from Marquez and, and, and uh, is, is been given permission the way he said Kafka gave him permission. I loved what you said, Deborah, that Kafka really freed him. I think that he's freed many people. Um, so Harriet, your story is, um, it's, so, so, so your story was published first in 1950. Yours was published in 1955, and I don't remember the year that yours was published, but it was, it was later. Um, well, just tell us about how you responded when I sent it. It's, um, it has a mystery at its heart. They all seem to have a mystery at their heart. So they're kind of elusive. And when you first read them, they're kind of slippery. And then um, with your help, actually, it was to do with finding who is the narrator at any given point. And there's something about this particular story that makes me think of the, the very beginning essence of all of our profession, which is storytelling and the sort of oral tradition, the pre-literate tradition, it somehow felt like this community that had its eyes opened to the existence of another world um, and, and different scale of people. Um, and the only way the only way they'd found this out was via the sea and via what the sea had thrown up on their shore. Um, and I just thought that's, that's some way um, a very primitive origin of telling, weaving stories to, to kind of pass on an experience that had happened to a community that there was no way of really explaining the enormity of this, the, the extraordinariness of this event and that it had taken on this sort of village mythology and expanded their hearts because he was somebody who they there was no room for him in their imagination i just i just love that and so it's it's all i mean every single one of us had a different particular problem or challenge or excitement or something to get hold of and for me it was something to do with conveying this mystery um and yes, you do your preparation and, and Cedaring nurses you through it. And then it changes, the chemistry changes because of you. Um, and it's suddenly you hear yourself 
doing it in a different way from you ever imagined, but you kind of had to do the homework in order to get there at all, but it's not how you planned it. It's, it changes, the chemistry changes because of the listeners. And um, that's what makes it rather thrilling. Yeah, yeah, right over there. Um, it's interesting what you're saying about the timing, because I think these two definitely had that sense of, I hesitate to say the phrase magical realism, but um, that, and the storytelling and the grandma at the knee. Um, Harriet said rather brilliantly in the break that she didn't think she'd managed to be a very good brick. Um, and um, yeah, I definitely uh, failed on the brick front. But I think the, the fact that it's the earliest story, it was the, it's the most dramatic. It's, it, there's not a lot, there is a mystery at the heart, but there's no, not much magical realism there. And, and what struck me at the time was that it's so, so dramatic and you almost have to hold me back from acting out the whole scene. I wanted to do the fat man and the tart at the counter. And um, so, yeah, I, I feel this, is the, this was the, the least sort of at, at his grandmother's knee and the most uh, dramatic of the, of the three. And it was just such a pleasure to play the characters um, and uh, and it was it's very filmic you know the the eye flicking to the clock and the customer coming and sitting in the corner of the room and it just seems ripe for a short film that I'm dying to make now. <laughs> if we have any investors in the room yeah. please Anybody see us afterwards. <laughs> I don't want to take up very much more of your time I'd like to bring Diana back up on stage and say thank you for having Word Theatre. And we have many shows in London. And if you'd like to be on our email list, please go to wordtheatre.com. It's on your programs. And thank you again, Deborah. Beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Um, well, I don't think we could have found three more powerful stories um, to end the short story festival um, with, with the voice of Gabriel Garcia Marquez um, and three most wonderful actresses, well, two actresses and one actor um, to bring those stories alive for us. Uh, and it was an added bonus um, hearing a little bit about um, what, the pro what the process was for them. So I would, I would just like to end this first weekend of Small Wonder um, by thanking Deborah Levy um, for her beautiful introduction. She's still there in the audience. <laughs> Cedaring Fox and her colleague uh, Kirsty Pitt for um, bringing us this production from Word Theatre today. Of course, Rashan Stone, Harriet Waters, and Olivia Williams. Thank you so much. Okay, for those of you who don't know, we have a final day, actually, of Small Wonder um, this coming Wednesday. But for now, um, well, we'll bring the, well, I don't know if there's still any drink left in the, in the bar, but if there is, drink to Marquez. Yeah. <laughs>